All right, Ryan, what's on your radar? Well, Joe Biden has talked wistfully about his hope to one day be remembered as a president the caliber of FDR. But if he doesn't wake up, his actual legacy will be the president who privatized Medicare because he wasn't paying attention to what his revolving door staff was up to. So Medicare is currently engaged in a sprawling experiment that is growing unchecked with no plans for the government to rein it in. It's being done under the authority that the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation has to launch pilot programs aimed at saving money or improving care. But it's quickly getting out of control and it's arguably illegal. The Trump era pilot is called a direct contracting program and it does basically what the name implies. Throughout the medical industry, physician practices, hospitals, groups of specialists, etc., are all being bought up by investors and consolidated. A lot of this is private equity money that benefits from special tax treatment. In other words, we're encouraging this through policy. Once the investors have bought up a physician's practice, they can then contract directly with Medicare to basically insure all of their parents, or they can contract indirectly with insurance companies and then contract with Medicare. It's complicated, but the way they make their money is by charging Medicare more than they spend on care for the patients. In that model, they basically have the same incentive as insurers, which is to deny as much care as possible. But they're in an even better spot to do it than insurers since they are the actual health care providers. The name for this is managed care, and it's extremely unpopular with patients, which explains why the industry is doing it so quietly. And there's no evidence that it actually saves money or improves care. But by the time the experiment in innovation is over, the bulk of the system could be privatized, and putting it back in the public barn will be impossible, because doctors will be able to fearmonger their patients about the unknown and a government takeover of health care. Instead, we're going to get a private equity takeover of health care. So Diane Archer, a health policy expert and president of Just Care, talked with Nicole Sandler in a recent interview about this privatization scheme. And what happens when you're in it? So some people think it's completely harmless for you if you are enrolled because you do have the right to go out of the insurer or the investor's network and get your care covered. Mm-hmm. But what we also know is that the insurers and investors make more money the less care you receive. Sure. So their goal, much like the Medicare Advantage plans, and it really works like Medicare Advantage in this regard, is to take the money that it receives from the government to care for you and pocket as much of it as possible. And, that their, and their responsibility to their shareholders is to do that. At the center of this privatization project is Liz Fowler. If you've been following my reporting for a while, you know her as the lead health care staffer for former Senator Max Baucus, who drafted massive chunks of the Affordable Care Act. Liz was in the trenches battling progressives over the shape and construction of Obamacare. And before that, she had been a top lobbyist for the insurance company WellPoint. After that, she went on to work for Johnson & Johnson. Now she's back in government as the deputy administrator and director of CMMI, the innovation agency created by the law she helped write. And people involved in the fight over this project tell me that she's its driving force at this point. Meanwhile, Biden has made Susan Rice the head of his domestic policy council, despite the fact that she spent basically her entire career doing foreign policy. So while she learns on the job, people like Fowler, who are sharp, experienced, and know what they're doing, are running circles around her. In May, four Democrats in Congress, Representatives Bill Pascrell, Mark Pocan, Katie Porter, and Lloyd Doggett, sent a letter to CMMI and to HHS Secretary Javier Becerra, who is himself a supporter of Medicare for All, asking for the program to be frozen. In a sign of how big this project has gotten, it has its own lobby now. The Direct Contracting Coalition, which operates as part of America's physician groups, sent a letter in response arguing that the critics don't understand how much it can help beneficiaries and how much it can cut costs for the government. Now, it's true, of course, that the the traditional Medicare model of fee-for-service isn't perfect, and it encourages doctors to order unnecessary but expensive tests or recommend pricey treatments when cheaper ones might actually be better. That's a function of having a public single payer and and private providers. Paying for quality over quantity is, of course, the ideal way to do it. But it's hard to believe that a Trump era program overseen by a former insurance lobbyist is going to get us there. There's a simpler way to answer the question. 
Freeze the program now before it's too late and study it closely. Emily, is that too radical of an approach? How about we just take a look and see whether or not this is working? Uh, yeah, what, what would Trump say? Uh, freeze it until we know what the hell is going yeah, on. Yeah. Yes, it, a complete and total shutdown of the privatization of Medicare until we can figure out what's going on. Right, but that's the thing. It's like we know what's going on in this case, and we know what's been going on with our healthcare system where the incentives don't exist in a way that allows the free market to be the most efficient sort of delivery. And I'm not a supporter of Medicare for all because I uh, quiver at the thought of the government taking over our healthcare system in a way that is, is not going to be, I think, conducive to the quality of care. But at the same time, nor is the radical privatization that we have right now, and of course there's a lot of government interference and all of those things, and radical free market people will make that argument, but the incentives in healthcare don't line up, and the way that um, the podcast host explained that in the clip that you showed was exactly on point as to how how are you supposed to, none of these incentives are for quality care. Right. The, the, there's, a, there's not a, uh, a harmony between the incentive for quality care and the incentive for money making and, and benefiting your shareholders in every case in the healthcare right. system. It just doesn't work that way. Right, because if you end up, get, and, and Diane talks about how there's a flat rate for a lot of these patients, so then that incentivizes you to, own, you know, to try to recruit the healthiest people into your practices. Yeah. So that those are the people that are then auto-enrolled, you get the money for them. They come in, you're like, yeah, yeah you're fine. There is, the, you know, the, there are examples of ways that you can encourage quality. And, and a good one is that these, uh, a, a lot of hospitals were seeing a lot of reinfections because they weren't basically, they basically they weren't cleaning up well enough. And so the, you know, there, there were, you know, people were getting reinfected, people were getting infected. And so they, the, and so uh, the Affordable Care Act said, look, you know, if you're going to get financially penalized for you know, readmittance to the hospital because somebody got an inf a staph infection while they're getting a getting surgery or while they're you know while they're recovering, and you're going to get rewarded if you reduce the number of uh, readmittances that you have from in infections. So hospitals are like, oh, this is something we need to prioritize. Mm. Let's get a, let's get a crew on this that makes sure that we're actually doing this effectively. Lo and behold, turns out they could actually clean up better and make the place more sterile, and so there are fewer infections, and fewer people are dying as a result of that. So it's possible. But if, if nobody is paying attention to it kind of from a patient perspective, and instead you're coming at it from the insurance industry perspective, insurance lobbyist perspective, just focused on reducing costs alone, then uh, you can talk all you want about quality, but you, you know where it's going to head. And that's the other thing I was going to say. Your coverage of Liz Fowler is so fascinating because it shows how we can talk until we're blue in the face about some of these really high-profile examples of revolving door lobbyists going into government and people like Susan Rice who are sort of appointed to positions for which they really have no experience. Yeah. Um, but. You, you, what you don't realize is the people whose names you don't know are having enormous impact on policy. Somebody who was a staffer right. for Baucus and is now under Susan Rice doing a ton of work. Nobody knows Liz Fowler. Um, it's not a super high profile name. And here it is. Like you can see plain as day, like going through Johnson and Johnson and then going back into this role. Why would she be put in that role? Why? Right. Why? And the answer is so obvious but so depressing. Right. And too often we moralize these kinds of things and, and put value judgments on them and say that these are good people or bad people, but this is what the, syst this is what the system yeah. produces. And if you have spent your entire career you know, in, in this, in this per from this particular perspective on this side of the question, you're going to come at the questions with a particular perspective. And what you need to do is balance that out with people who have the other perspective but to but there's there's really no financial you know kind of system set up to keep those people in Washington and to get and to move them through the ranks so that they're the ones that are also in an agency like CMMI and so right, right you have people you have people who have strong opinions on one side uh, and then you have nobody 
on the other side, so it's like the insurance industry is pushing on an open door. No, I think you're totally right to say that uh, the, the moralization makes things, it, it can muddy things sometimes in that like when you go through all of these different experiences, including private and public sector, you do emerge as an expert, really, right. you do. But then when you go back into the public sector, you have lobbyists chirping in your ears um, because you're in that position since they get access and they have disproportionate access to you and you um, are listening to them disproportionately and that's not really good for anyone. Right, and Susan Rice is like, what's going on? <laughs> yeah, yes. that's, a, uh, that's what you think we should do? Sounds good. <laughs> seems, seems smart to me. Yeah. Anyway, looking forward to what's on your radar.